Hey guys, Trent here. One of the students that I started to train recently came to me and had zero experience with the Garmin G1000 and had com come from steam gauges. And that particular student really found the learning curve to be very steep for the G1000. And of course, if you're trying to learn in the aircraft at aircraft rental rates, it gets fairly expensive. And the great thing about Microsoft Flight Simulator is that the G1000 is remarkably realistic relative to the real thing. So in today's video, um, this is part one of a series that I'm going to do on the G1000 to give you the basics so that you can make good use of this fantastic piece of avionics kit. So what you're seeing on the screen right now um, is the PFD, the primary function display, and then over here we have the MFD, which is screen number two, the multifunction display. We're going to cover that one in more detail in a future video. Today we're going to remain focused predominantly on the PFD. So on the PFD, uh, we're going to start here in the top left. These are your nav frequencies, so you have the ability. You've got nav 1, you've got nav 2, you can see the little blue box. This is the standby frequency, and then, so if you want to make a change, you could twist the knob, and then you could set the standby frequency to become the active frequency. Um, then here on the left is your airspeed indicator. So this is your indicated airspeed, and thanks to the lovely computer that's part of the G1000, it will automatically calculate your true airspeed for you. So you can see right now, 156 degrees. We've got an outside air temperature down here of 11 degrees Celsius, and a true airspeed of 168 knots. We also have winds coming from 255, at two knots, and this is, and uh, I absolutely love this part of the G1000 when I'm flying the real plane, because if you're doing ground maneuvers or what have you as a part of your training, and those ground maneuvers require entry into the maneuver with downwind, um, or a downwind entry into the maneuver, then of course it makes it very easy to see while you're up at elevation what direction the wind is coming from. I'm in autopilot right now. You can see here we've, we're in the heading mode. The autopilot is engaged. We've got altimeter, the, the, uh, rather the altitude set at 4,300 feet, which is here. You can see that we're at 4,300 feet and we've got our little altitude bug right here. This is our heading bug right here. We're heading 002 right now. So if you wanted to make a change to heading while in heading mode, you would simply twist this particular dial right here. So if you wanted to go to heading say 345, you can see I've twisted it to 345. That number shows up there, plain banks, and of course we'll steer you over to 345. Now speaking of bank, what we've got up here is essentially the equivalent of the slip and skid and turn coordinator in a typical steam gauge aircraft. So this here, which is referred to as the brick, replaces the ball. So you can see when I step on the rudder pedals, that has an impact. It made, we went uncoordinated there. If the brick is right underneath this triangle, that's a coordinated turn. So obviously when I'm in autopilot mode, because the autopilot is an efficient pilot, you can see that this is a coordinated turn. Now, if you were flying this manually out of autopilot and the brick was over here, all you would do, just like the ball, is you're gonna step on the brick. Um, much like you would step on the ball in the old steam gauge scenario. Each of these first three hash lines here is 10 degrees angle of bank. This one is 15 and this one is also 15. So if you're working on your steep turns in your private pilot training, you're gonna be spending a lot of time uh, over here at the 45 degree angle of bank. This thing here in the middle, we call it the meatball. Um, the pink or magenta here, this is the flight director, which is a part of the autopilot, but it, you can actually use the flight director without the autopilot. We may cover that later in this video or in a subsequent one. And then this, these yellow wings here are essentially helping you to know what your attitude is. So this white line here is the horizon. Obviously we've got sky and then we've got our synthetic vision down below um, indicating ground. So if you were to take the autopilot off, You've got here, you can see there's a pitch up attitude of two and a half degrees, a pitch up attitude of five degrees. And then down here, we have a pitch down attitude of two and a half degrees, a pitch down attitude of five degrees and so forth. The other thing that's really cool about that meatball in the middle is let's say we wanna make a level turn to the left. If you keep your eye on the meatball and you keep the meatball on the horizon line, which I'm attempting to do here reasonably well, um, you will, for the most part, be making a level turn. 
Meatball is also very, very helpful if you're coming in on an approach. Uh, if you place the meatball on the threshold of the runway, the plane will fly to wherever the meatball is. So it is a wonderful little tool for assisting you in getting the plane going where you want it to go. So let's go ahead and re-engage the autopilot. We're going to do that by hitting the AP button and we're going to reset our heading so that we don't steer all the way back over to where we were and we'll continue flying at 4,300 feet. Now below or to the right of this altitude indicator is our vertical speed indicator in straight and level flight. You obviously see no number here, but let's say for example that I wanted to go up to Oh, I don't know, we'll just pick a random number, 4,600 feet, and we wanted to do it with a vertical speed up of 400 feet per minute. You can see the 400 here, you can see the 400 here, and now you can see that we're actually at increasing altitude at 350 to 400 feet per minute. Now, altitude is only as accurate as your barometer setting. Um, so each time you're listening to the weather, you're passed off from one ATC to another, and you need to make an adjustment to your inches of mercury, you're going to grab this big round borrow knob here and twist in whatever changes is required to ensure that you have an accurate altitude measurement given the uh, pressure altitude of the day. Down here at the bottom is our HSI. This is an absolutely uh, wonderful instrument to use. Currently we are in GPS mode, which you can see here. This particular aircraft is equipped with two VORs, so we could hit CDI one time to go VOR1. We can hit CDI another time to go VOR2, and I'm gonna cover VORs a lot more in a subsequent video because there are some pretty cool things that you can do. It makes the, uh, your life a whole lot easier versus flying with steam gauges. Over here on the right, we've got COM1 and COM2. Works exactly the same way as NAV1 and NAV2. So right now our active frequency is 127.85 in COM1 and 124.85 in COM2. Let's say that I wanted to go down to 120.850. That's the standby frequency. Go ahead here and make that frequency active. This is the volume knob and this little arrow here shows you that right now we're using COM1. If you finger press or click on this button here, you can see that now you're going ahead and using COM2. So down here we have, uh, first of all, your transponder. If you're flying VFR, you're going to be 1200 alt, should be in the green. This is going to be your UTC time and the plane or the, rather this piece of equipment comes equipped with a wonderful little timer. So if you want to use that timer, for example, for time turns in a hold, um, you'll easily able to do so. Enter and we can do our one minute time and we can stop it and reset it whenever we like. If you want your, and you can't see them now, but if I slow the plane down, we might be able to get slow enough. You're going to have your V speeds also actually so you don't have to memorize your v-speeds so you can see here we've got the white area for the flaps safe zone for this particular aircraft and then we've got um, our best glide here and then slowly coming on to the screen we've got vy and then we're going to see vx and then we're going to see vr and if you needed to change those you're able to do that um, simply by rotating the big knob through and then making whatever changes you would like to make and you can even turn those on or off and if you're doing instrument flying and you want to set your minimums in you can go ahead and do that as well and it all works exactly the same as the real aircraft which is super slick so let's add a little bit of power back now so that we don't stall the plane and I want to show you a couple see this little magenta line here this is one of three different trend lines on the PFD which are very useful. The magenta line on the airspeed, the heading and the altimeter essentially shows you where you're going to be in about six seconds. So let's go ahead and do a big heading twist here and you'll see that magenta line pops out to what's called the standard rate turn. So if if the end of the magenta line lines up with that little white hash mark right there, that is a standard rate turn, which is in this aircraft here, 
is uh, generally about 22 or 23 degrees. Same thing can be said here. So let's say that we wanted to go back down to 4,000, vertical speed down. So we're going now down at 1,100 feet per minute, which is obviously pretty steep. So you're going to see that again, six seconds from now, you're going to be at 4,400 feet and another six seconds from wherever you are now you're going to be at 4300 feet and so forth so let's go ahead and just level us back out at around 4200 feet now in the event that you are lost one of the things that i find especially if you know you're, you're not even lost you're just doing a lot of training in the same area all the time this nearest airport button here is absolutely your friend so once you've selected nearest, you can simply pick whatever, what other, whatever airport you would like to go to. So let's say I want to go to S87, or actually let's go to Ontario, which is Kono. So it shows me that it's 9.3 miles away. It tells me the Unicom frequency, tells me the length of the runway. If I want to go there, direct, enter, enter. There it is behind us. I can put it in nav mode and as you can see the aircraft immediately starts to turn to intercept the course which you can actually see over on the MFD. There is the course from where we are to that airport and I'll tell you that when I'm training my students and we're out doing cross countries and we're uh, out on what I call the milk run, we're using that nearest button a lot. All right, so if you need to make a change to the transponder, you can put in a code and then put in whatever transponder code you would like, and you'll see that it shows up. If you are using flight following, for example, and they give you a code, that's how you would do it. And then once flight following cancels and says resume on nav navigation and squawk VFR, all you need to do is come back and click VFR, and it switches it back to 1200. If they ask you to ident after you've put in a transponder code, that would be this button here. Now another couple of things we have on the PFD options. So we have the wind button. You can see here I'm on option three and that's got the wind going here. You could turn that off. You could have option one, you could have option two, or you could have option three. I like option three the best. And then if you want to set up bearing indicators, so your bearing one, which is down here on the bottom left, can be set to nav one, to nav two, to your ADF, or to your GPS. So that's exceptionally beneficial if you need to be able to track, for example, oops, wrong button. If you want to track two different VORs at the same time while you're flying in GPS mode, you tune those VORs into nav one and into nav two, and it makes it very easy. Those needles will go ahead and point to whatever VFR you're tracking, and uh, you'll be able to see that. So let me see if I can find a VOR here. I'm just going to pause the video real quick. I'll find a VOR and I'll get the frequency and I'll punch it in. All right, so now you can see that I programmed in 113.3, which is the BOI, Boise VOR. And you can see here while we're flying in GPS mode, we can see that the direction to the station is uh, to the east. So that's super, super helpful if, for example, you're doing a missed approach and you need to climb and maintain and then turn on a radial of a certain VOR, but um, you would like to uh, not necessarily put it in um, using the CDI button. You don't necessarily want to go into VOR mode. Um, you can do that by simply using these other bearing pointers. So those are actually super, super helpful. All right, so I think this video is, oh, and the last thing here, when you're in a direct to mode, uh, one of the things that's also very useful, you can see where are you going, uh, the distance until you get there, and the bearing until you arrive. And then finally, uh, if there are any alerts about fuel changes or any issues, uh, those alerts are going to show up here, and any other warnings would, net, would go ahead and show up here. So that is the a very quick overview um, of 
the PFD on the Garmin G1000. If you found this video helpful and are looking forward to seeing part two, if you have questions, first of all, please do leave those questions down in the comments below. If you have suggestions or things that maybe I didn't cover in this video and you'd like me to cover in a subsequent video that is a part of this series, I'm very happy to do that. And if uh, this is your first time watching one of my videos and you would like to see subsequent videos in this series, please consider becoming a subscriber and clicking the little bell. Um, and if you want to get email notifications of when I produce new videos, you can go over to flywithtrent.com and join the email list. Thanks very much for watching. It's been a pleasure to have you here. I hope you go and have a great day up in the friendly skies. Talk to you again soon, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.